Anu and Anatu. To resume the tale, in her wrath and humiliation, Ishtar appealed to her father and mother, and begged the former to create a mighty bull and send it against Gilgamesh. Anu at first demurred, declaring that if he did so, it would result in seven years' sterility on the earth. But finally he consented, and a great bull, Alu, was sent to do battle with Gilgamesh. The portion of the text which deals with combat is much mutilated, but it appears that the conflict was hot and sustained. The celestial animal finally succumbed to a sword thrust from Gilgamesh. Ishtar looks on in impotent anger. Then Ishtar went up to the wall of strong-walled Eric. She mounted to the top and she uttered a curse, saying, Cursed be Gilgamesh, who has provoked me to anger and has slain the bull from heaven. Then Ibani incurs the anger of the deity. When Ibani heard these words of Ishtar, he tore out the entrails of the bull, and he cast them before her, saying, As for thee, I will conquer thee, and I will do thee even as I have done to him. Ishtar was beside herself with rage. Gilgamesh and his companions dedicated the great horns of the bull to the sun god, and having washed their hands in the river of Euphrates, returned once more to Eric. The triumphal procession passed through the city. The people came out of their houses to do honor to the heroes. The remainder of the tablet is concerned with the great banquet given by Gilgamesh to celebrate his victory over the bull Alu, with further visions of Ibani. The seventh and eighth tablet are extremely fragmentary, and so much for the text as is perceived is open to various readings. It is possible that to the seventh tablet belongs a description of the underworld given to Ibani in a dream by the temple maiden Ukhut, whom he had cursed in a previous tablet, and who had since died. The description answers to that given in another ancient text, the myth of Ishtar's descent into Hades, and eventually embodies the popular belief concerning the underworld. Come descend with me to the house of darkness, the abode of Urkala, to the house whence the enterer goes not forth, to the path whose way has no return, to the house whose dwellers are deprived of light, where dust is their nourishment, and earth their good. They are clothed like the bird in a garment of feathers. They see not the light, they dwell in darkness. The Death of Ebony The sinister vision appears to have been a presage of Ebony's death. Shortly afterwards, he fell ill and died at the end of twelve days. The manner of his death is uncertain. One reading of the mutilated text represents Ebony as being wounded, perhaps in battle, and succumbing to the effects of the wound. But another makes him say to his friend Gilgamesh, I have been cursed, my friend. I shall not die as one who has been slain in battle. The breaks in the text are responsible for the divergence. The latter reading is probably the correct one. Ebony has grievously offended Ishtar. The all-powerful and the curse which has smitten him to the earth is probably hers. In modern folklore phraseology, he died of juju. The death of the hero brings the eighth tablet to close. In the ninth tablet, we find Gilgamesh mourning the loss of his friend. The Quest of Gilgamesh on the heart of Gilgamesh, likewise, the fear of death had taken hold, and he determined to go in search of his ancestor, Utnapishtim, who might be able to show him a way of escape. Straight away, putting his determination into effect, Gilgamesh set out for the abode of Utnapishtim. On the way, he had to pass through the mountainous gorges, made terrible by the presence of the wild beasts. From the power of these he was delivered by Sin, the moon god, who enabled him to traverse the mountain passes in safety. At length, he came to a mountain higher than the rest, the entrance to which was guarded by scorpion men. This was Mashu, the mountain of the sunset which lies on the western horizon, between the earth and the underworld. 
Then he came to the mountain of Mashu, the portals of which are guarded every day by monsters. Their backs mount up to the ramparts of heaven, and their foreparts reach down beneath Erelu. Scorpion men guard the gate of Mashu. They strike terror into men, and it's death to behold them. The splendor is great, for it overwhelms the mountain. From sunrise to sunset, they guard the sun. Gilgamesh beheld them, and his face grew dark with fear and terror, and the wildness of their aspect robbed him of his senses. On approaching the entrance to the mountain, Gilgamesh found his way barred by these scorpion men, who, perceiving the strain of divinity in him, did not blast him with their glance, but questioned him regarding his purpose in drawing near the mountain of Mashu. When Gilgamesh had replied to their queries, telling them how he wished to reach the abode of his ancestor, ut Napishtam, and there learned the secret of perpetual life and youthfulness, the scorpion men advised him to turn back. Before him, they said, lay the region of thick darkness for twelve Kaspu, twenty-four hours. He would have to journey through the thick darkness eerie, he again emerged into the light of day. And so they refused to let him pass. But Gilgamesh implored, with tears, says the narrative. And at length, the monsters consented to admit him. Having passed the gates of the mountains of the sunset, by virtue of his character as a solar deity, Gilgamesh traversed the region of Thick during the space of twelve Kaspu. Toward the end of the period, the darkness became ever less pronounced. Finally, it was broad day, and Gilgamesh found himself in a beautiful garden or park studded with trees, among which was the Tree of the Gods, thus charmingly depicted in the text. Precious stones it bore as fruit, branches hung from it which were beautiful to behold. The top of the tree was lapis lazuli, and it was laden with fruit which dazzled the eye of him that beheld. Having paused to admire the beauty of the scene, Gilgamesh bent his steps shoreward. The tenth tablet describes the hero's encounter with the sea goddess Sabitu, who, on the approach of one, who had the appearance of a god, and whose body was grief, and who looked as though he had made a long journey, retired into her palace and fastened the door. But Gilgamesh, knowing that her help was necessary to bring him to the dwelling of ut Napishtim, told her of his quest, and in despair threatened to break down the door unless she opened to him. At last, Sabitu consented to listen to him. Whilst he asked the way to up Napishtim, like the scorpion men, the sea goddess perceived that Gilgamesh was not to be turned aside from his quest, so at last she bade him to go to Adad A, Ut Napishtim's ferryman, without whose aid, she said, it would be futile to persist further in his mission. Adad A, likewise being consulted by Gilgamesh, advised him to desist, but the hero pursuing his plan of intimidation began to smash the ferryman's boat with his axe, whereupon Adad A was obliged to yield. He sent his would-be passenger into the forest for a new rudder, and after that the two sailed away. Gilgamesh and Ut Napishtim Ut Napishtim was indeed surprised when he beheld Gilgamesh approaching the strand. The hero had meanwhile contracted a grievous illness, so that he was unable to leave the boat, but he addressed his queries concerning perpetual life to the defied ut Napishtim, who stood on the shore. The hero of the flood was exceedingly sorrowful, and explained that death is the common lot of mankind, nor is it given to man to know the hour when the hand of death will fall upon him. The Anunnaki, the great gods, decree fate, and with them Mometum, the maker of destiny, and they determine death and life, but the days of death are not known. The narrative is continued without interruption into the sixth tablet. Gilgamesh listened with pardonable skepticism to the platitudes of his ancestor. I behold thee, ut Napishtim. Thy appearance differs not from mine. Thou art like unto me. Thou art not otherwise than I am. Thou art like unto me. My heart stout for the battle. How hast thou entered assembly of the gods? How hast thou found life? The Deluge Myth in reply, ut Napishtim introduces the story of the Babylonian deluge, which, told as it is without interruption, forms a separate and complete narrative, and in itself a myth of exceptional interest. Presumably the warning of the deluge came to ut Napishtim in a vision. The voice of the god said, Thou man of Shuripak, son of Ubaratutu, pull down thy house, build a ship, forsake thy possessions, take the heed for thy life, abandon thy goods, save thy life, and bring up living seeds of every kind into the ship. The ship itself was to be carefully planned and built according to A's instructions. When the god had spoken, ut Napishtim promised obedience to the divine command. 
but he was still perplexed as to how he should answer the people when they asked the reason for his preparations. A therefore instructed him how he should make reply. Bel hath cast me forth, for he hateth me. The purpose of his reply seems clear, though the remaining few lines of it are rather broken. A intends that Utnapishtim shall disarm the suspicions of the people by declaring that the object of his shipbuilding and his subsequent departure is to escape the wrath of Bel, which he is to depict as falling on him alone. He must prophesy the reign of the coming, but must represent it, not as a devastating flood, but rather as a mark of the prosperity which Bel will grant to the people of Shuripak, perhaps by reason of his, Utnapishtim's departure therefrom. The Babylonian Ark Utnapishtim employed many people in the construction of the ship. During four days, he gathered the material and built the ship. On the fifth, he laid it down. On the sixth, he loaded it, and by the seventh day it was finished. On a hull of 120 cubits wide was constructed a great deck house, 120 cubits high, divided into six stories, each of which was divided in turn into nine rooms. The outside of the ship was made watertight with bitumen and the inside with pitch. To signalize the completion of his vessel, Utnapishtim gave a great feast, like that which was wont to be held on New Year's Day. Oxen were slaughtered and great quantities of wine and oil provided. According to the command of A, Utnapishtim brought into the ship all his possessions, his silver and his gold, living seed of every kind, all his family and household, the cattle and the beasts of the field, the handy craftsmen, all that was his. A heavy rain at eventide was the sign for Utnapishtim to enter the ship and fasten the door. All night long it rained, and with the early dawn there came up from a horizon a black cloud. Ramon in the mist thereof thundered, and Nabu and Marduk went before. They passed like messengers over the mountain and plain. Uragal parted the anchor cable. There went Ninib, and he made the storm to burst. The Anunnaki carried flaming torches, and with the brightness thereof they lit up the earth. The whirlwind of Ramon mounted up into the heavens, and all the light was turned into darkness. During a whole day darkness, and chaos appears to have reigned on earth. Men could no longer behold each other. The very gods in heaven were afraid and crouched like hounds, weeping and lamenting their share in the destruction of mankind. For six days and nights the tempest raged, but on the seventh day the rain ceased and the floods began to abate. Then says Upnapishtim, I looked upon the sea and cried aloud, for all mankind was turned back into clay. In place of the fields, a swamp lay before me. I opened the window, and the light fell upon my cheek. I bowed myself down. I sat down. I wept. Over my cheek flowed my tears. I looked upon the world, and behold, all was sea. The Bird Messengers At length, the ship came to the rest on the summit of Mount Nitzer. There are various readings on this portion of the text. Thus, after twelve days, the land appeared or at the distance of twelve caspo, the land appeared, or twelve cubits above the water, the land appeared. However this may be, the ship remained for six days on the mountain, and on the seventh, Utnapishtim sent out a dove. But the dove found no resting place, and so she returned. Then he sent out a swallow, which also returned, having found no spot whereon to rest. Finally, a raven was sent forth, and as by this time, the waters had begun to abate, the bird drew near to the ship, wading and croaking, but did not enter the vessel. Then Utnapishtim broke his household and all his possessions into the open air, and made offerings to the gods of reed and cedarwood and incense. The fragrant odor of the incense came up to the gods, and they gathered like flies, says the narrative, around the sacrifice. Among the company was Ishtar, the lady of the gods, who lifted up the necklace which Anu had given her, saying, What gods these are? by the jewels of lapis lazuli, which are upon my neck, I will not forget. These days I have set in my memory, never will I forget them. Let the gods come to the offering, but Bel shall not come to the offering, since he refused to ask counsel and sent the deluge, and handed over my people unto destruction. The god Bel was very wroth when he discovered that a mortal man had survived the deluge, and vowed that Utnapishtim should perish but A defended his action in having saved his favorite from destruction, pointing out that Bell had refused to take counsel when he planned a universal disaster, and advising him in future to visit the sin on the sinner and not to punish the entire race. 
Finally, Bell was mollified. He approached the ship, onto which it would appear that the remnants of the human race had retired during the altercation, and led Ut Napishtam and his wife into the open, where he bestowed on them his blessing. Then they took me, says Ut Napishtam, and afar off, at the mouth of the rivers, they made me to dwell. Such is the story of the deluge which Ut Napishtam told to Gilgamesh. No case is assigned for the destruction of the human race, other than the amenity which seems to have existed between man and the gods, particularly the warrior god Bel. But it appears from the latter part of the narrative that in the assembly of the gods, the majority contemplated only the destruction of the city of Shirapak, and not the entire human family. It has been suggested, indeed, that the story as it is here given is compounded of two separate myths, one relating to a universal catastrophe, perhaps a mythological type of a periodic inundation, and the other dealing with a local disaster, such as might have been occasioned by a phenomenal overflow of the Euphrates. The antiquity of legend and its original character are clearly shown by comparison with another version of the myth, inscribed on a tablet found at Abu Habath, the ancient site of Sippar and dated in the 21st century before our era. Notwithstanding the imperfect preservation of this text, it is possible to perceive it in many points of resemblance to the Gilgamesh variant. Barossus also quotes a version of the Deluge myth in his history, substituting Kronos for A, King Isuthros for Utnapishtim, and the city of Sippar for that of Shuripak. In this version, immortality is bestowed not only on the hero and his wife, but also on his daughter and his pilot. One writer ingeniously identifies these latter, with Sabatu and Adat A respectively. To return to the epic, the recital of Utnapishtim served its primary purpose in the narrative by proving to Gilgamesh that his case was not that of his defied ancestor. Meanwhile, the hero had remained on the boat, too ill to come ashore. Now Utnapishtim took pity on him and promised to restore him to health, first of all bidding him sleep during six days and seven nights. Gilgamesh listened to his ancestor's advice, and by and by, sleep, like a temptus, breathed upon him. Utnapishtim's wife, beholding the sleeping hero, was likewise moved with compassion and asked her husband to send the traveler safely home. He in turn bade his wife compound a magic preparation, containing seven ingredients, and administer it to Gilgamesh while he slept. This was done, and an enchantment thus put on the hero. When he awoke on the seventh day, he renewed his importunate request for the secret of perpetual life. His host sent him to a spring of water where he might bathe his sores and be healed. And having tested the efficacy of the magic waters, Gilgamesh returned once more to his ancestor's dwelling, doubtless to persist his quest for life. Notwithstanding that, Utnapishtim had already declared it impossible for Gilgamesh to attain immortality as he now directed him, apparently at the stance of his wife, to the place where he would find the plant of life and instructed Adad A to conduct him thither. The magic plant which bestowed immortality and eternal youth on him who ate it appears to have been a weed, a creeping plant with thorns which pricked the hands of the gatherer, and curiously enough, Gilgamesh seems to have sought it at the bottom of the sea. At length, the plant was found, and the hero declared his intention of carrying it with him to Eric. And so he set out on the return journey, accompanied by the faithful ferryman, not only on the first and watery stage of his travels, but also overland to the city of Eric itself. When they had journeyed twenty Kasbu, they left an offering presumably for the dead, and when they had journeyed thirty Kasbu, they repeated a funeral chant. The narrative goes on. Gilgamesh saw a well of fresh water. He went down to it and offered a libation. A serpent smelled the odor of the plant, advanced, and carried off the plant. Gilgamesh sat down and wept. The tears ran down his cheek. He lamented bitterly the loss of the precious plant seemingly predicted to him when he made his offering at the end of twenty Kasbu. At length, they reached Eric, when Gilgamesh sent Abad A to inquire concerning the building of the city walls, a proceeding which has possibly some mythological significance. The twelfth tablet opens with the lament of Gilgamesh for his friend Abani, whose loss he has not ceased to deplore. Thou canst no longer stretch thy bow upon the earth, and those who are slain with the bow are round about thee. Thou canst no longer bear a scepter in thy hand, and the spirits of the dead have taken thee captive. Thou canst no longer wear shoes upon thy feet. Thou canst no longer raise thy war cry on the earth. No more dost thou kiss thy wife, whom thou didst love. No more dost thou smite thy wife, whom thou didst hate. 
No more dost thou kiss thy daughter, whom thou didst love. No more dost thou smite thy daughter, from whom thou didst hate. The sorrow of the underworld hath taken hold upon thee. Gilgamesh went from temple to temple, making offerings, and desiring the gods to restore Abani to him. To Nimsum he went, to Bel, and to Sin, the moon god, but they heeded him not. At length he cried to A, who took compassion upon him, and persuaded Nergal to bring the shade of Abani from the underworld. A hole was open in the earth, and the spirit of the dead man issued there from like a breath of wind. Gilgamesh addressed Abani, thus, Tell me, my friend, tell me, my friend. The law of the earth, which thou hast seen, tell me. Abani answered him, I cannot tell thee, my friend, I cannot tell thee. But afterwards, having bidden Gilgamesh sit down and weep, he proceeded to tell him of the conditions which prevailed in the underworld, contrasting the lot of the warrior duly buried with that of a person whose corpse is cast uncared for into the fields. On a couch he layeth and drinketh pure water, the man who was slain in battle. Thou and I have oft seen such an one, his father and his mother support his head, and his wife kneeleth at his side. But the man whose corpse is cast upon the field, thou and I have oft seen such an one. His spirit resteth not in the earth, the man whose spirit has none to care for it, thou and I have oft seen such an one. The dregs of the vessel, the leavings of the feast, and that which cast upon the streets are his food. Upon his solemn note the epic closes. The doctrine of the necessities for the ministering to the dead is here enunciated in no uncertain fashion, unless their bodies are decently buried and offering of food and drink made at their graves, their lives in the underworld must be abjectly miserable. The manner in which they meet their end is likewise taken into account, and warriors who have fallen on the field of battle are preeminently fortunate. Abany evidently one of the happy spirits, his ghost is designated a tuku, a name applied not only to the fortunate dead, but likewise to a class of beneficent supernatural beings. The term edemu, on the other hand, designates a species of malevolent being as well as the errant and even vampirish spirits of the unhappy dead. The dual observance of funeral and commemorative rites is thus a matter which touches the interests not only of the deceased, but also of his relatives and friends. We have seen from the foregoing that the Epic of Gilgamesh is partly historical, partly mythological. Around the figure of a great national hero, myths have grown entwined with the passing of the generations, and these have in time become woven into a connective narrative, setting forth a myth which corresponds to the daily or annual course of the sun, may be discerned other myths and fragments of myths, solar, seasonal, and diluvian. But there is in the epic another important element which has already been referred to, the astrotheological. The zodiacal significance of the division of the epic into twelve tablets may be set aside, since, as has been indicated, the significance is in all probability a superficial one merely, added to the poem by the scribes of Ashurbani Paul, and not forming an integral part of it. At the same time, it's not hard to divide the epic naturally into twelve episodes. Thus, 1. Gilgamesh's oppression of Eric. 2. The seduction of Abani. 3. The slaying of the monster Kumbaba. 4. The wooing of Ishtar. 5. The fight with the sacred bull. 6. Abani's death. 7. Gilgamesh's journey to the mountain of the sunset. 8. Wanderings in the region of thick darkness. 9. The crossing of the waters of death. 10. The deluge story. 11. The plant of life. 12. The return of Abany's spirit. Throughout the epic, there are indications of correspondence between the exploits of the hero and the movements of heavenly bodies. It is possible, for instance, that Gilgamesh and his friend Abany had some relation to the sign Gemini, also associated in ancient Chaldean mythology with two forms of the solar deity, even as were the hero and his friend. The sign Leo recalls the slaying of Kumbaba, the allegorical victory of light over darkness, represented on monuments by the figures of a lion, symbol of fire, fighting with a bull. Following the sign of Leo, the wooing of the hero by the goddess Ishtar falls naturally into the sign of Virgo, the virgin. The sign of Taurus is represented by the slaying of the celestial bull, Alu, by Gilgamesh, the journey of the hero to the Mashu and his encounter with the Scorpion Man at the Gate of the Sunset are, of course, mythological representations of the sign of Scorpio, as are also his wanderings in the region of thick darkness. 
It is noticeable in this respect that Babylonian astrology often doubled the eighth sign, Scorpio, to provide a seventh. It is therefore not unlikely that the sign should not correspond with two distinct episodes in one poem. The first of these episodes is associated with Scorpio by virtue of the introduction of Scorpion men, and the second on the assumption that the Scorpion is symbolical of darkness. Perhaps the sea goddess Sabitu is associated astrologically with the fish-tailed goat, which is the conventional representation of Capricorns. Then the placing of the deluge story in the 11th tablet, corresponding with the 11th sign of the zodiac, Aquarius. The water bearer is evidently in keeping with the astrological aspect of the epic. Chaldean mythology connected the rainy 11th month with the deluge, just as the first month of spring was associated mythologically with the creation. The healing of Gilgamesh's sickness by Utnapishtim may possibly symbolize the revival of the sun after leaving the winter solstice. Lastly, the sign of Pisces, the twelfth sign of the zodiac, corresponding to the return of Abini from the underworld, and perhaps also to the restoration of Gilgamesh to Eric, is emblematic of life after death and of the resumption of ordinary conditions after the deluge. It has been suggested, though, without any definite basis, that the epic was first put together before the zodiac was divided into twelve, that is, more than two thousand years before the Christian era. Its antiquity, however, rests on the grounds than these. In later times, the Babylonian astrological system became very complicated and important, and so lent its color to the epic that, whatever the original plan of the work may have been, its astral significance became at length its most important aspect.